Yeah, so every, every, all eight, they start the same start. Oh, it, it doesn't mean fairness, it's like, you say two hours? Yeah, what it would almost do is come up with like 10 grass, and then he has one or something. I mean, he's done. I know, right, I was thinking, I mean, you know why. So he kind of, yeah, he's very relaxed, so when we get the past, like a joke. 
Oh, is this, yeah. Yeah, the Castle Battle. I was worried about creating it, so I was like, hi, Seriously, that's what it is. Thank you. 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 Because it's less than San Diego, you know? <laughs> that's right. That's, 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 that's not sad. Somebody did write the Bakerki? No. I put that on the screen. It was pretty interesting. interesting. Maybe like three that's months ago. Yeah. I liked it. Everyone's a little blown. Yeah. But now it's just not. Yeah, that's a bad part. Well, unless this comes up with something, basically, yeah. something. You don't want to see something like this. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right when he gets really sick, like the next day, I think he's just about out. No, it's not allergies. I know what allergies feel like. So they're making us get the piece of the chemistry rod. They make us come with our own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, which gets within some ratio uh, R of the optimum. So this is most easily described for optimization questions. So let's take vertex cover as an example. Okay. So you know that telling whether a vertex cover, whether it's possible to cover all the edges of a graph with a certain number of vertices so that at least one end of each edge is covered, you know that finding the smallest possible thing is basically NP-complete. Or to be a little more precise, you know that the decision question, the yes or no question, here's a number k, does there exist a vertex cover of size k or less, you know that that problem is NP-complete because we proved it. Um, so this is a minimization problem. You're trying to cover the graph with as few vertices as possible. Um, so we know that finding the absolute smallest is, seems to be very hard. What about a polynomial time algorithm which finds a reasonably small uh, vertex cover, where reasonably small means not too much bigger than the smallest possible? OK? So in particular, Nate is going to show you a polynomial time algorithm for vertex cover in which r equals 2. So it is a, as people sometimes call it, a 2 approximation. And what that means is that it finds a vertex cover which is at most twice as big as the smallest possible one. OK? And it turns out that you can do that in polynomial time. So that's kind of nice to know. Okay. So there's a polynomial time algorithm to find a vertex cover which is not too bad. It's at most twice as bad as the best. Um, similarly, for the traveling salesman problem, um, if you restrict yourself to what's called the Euclidean traveling salesman problem, where what does that mean? It means that the cities are actually laid out in the plane, and the distances between them are actually their straight line distances. OK? Um, or actually, I'm not sure if you, a, a weaker condition is that something called the triangle inequality holds, right? So the triangle inequality says that the distance from city A to city C is at most the sum of the distances, the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C. Okay. This isn't always true, actually. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, it could be that if by distance we mean cost of the cheapest plane ticket, this might not be true. But if it means geographical distance is certainly true because the edge of any triangle is at most the length of the other two edges. The extreme case is when it's a flattened out triangle, when this is exactly the sum of those two. And intuitively, the idea is that one way to get from A to C is to go through B. OK? Anyway, uh, when we defined the traveling salesman problem, we didn't impose anything like this, right? So we just said, well, let the matrix of distances between the cities be, uh, be arbitrary. Um, did we actually ever define the traveling system problem? No. Oh, well, see, you, know, you guys need to be, you need to be on your toes, and uh, you need to object loudly. Uh, well, OK, let's define it and prove it's NP-complete. <laughs> so, The input is a matrix of distances d i j where there are n cities and a total length l. And the question is, 
does there exist a tour of the cities? In other words, an order in which you can visit the cities, which visits each city exactly once with total length less than or equal to k. OK? That's the traveling salesman problem. What is uh, OK? What is a k? You mean L. Oh, sorry, L. So can I visit all the cities within this? And, and these distances could be measured in miles. They could be measured in hours. It could be a question of, of can I visit all these cities within a certain amount of time. They could be measured in dollars. Um, I have a certain budget. And can I visit all the cities within that budget? OK, prove to me that this is NP complete. Clearly, we should, we should try to prove that Hamiltonian path reduces to traveling salesman, okay? Because Hamiltonian path is the, of all the NP-complete problems we've seen, it is the one which looks the most similar. Uh, tell me, uh, okay, by the way, first, prove to me that this is in NP. Yeah, if the answer is yes, you can show me the tour. I can clearly add up the distances and make sure that they're less than or equal to L. All right, but remember that that is part of what you're obligated to do. Okay. So when you are trying to prove that something is NP complete, first you have to show it's an NP, which is usually pretty obvious, like this one was. Then you have to take some other problem which is known to be NP complete and reduce it to your problem. Um, and so remind me, what do I have to do to make this reduction work? What place, I mean? No. No, no, I mean, you have to construct it from a special yeah. case. Of General case of Hamiltonian to special case of ATSP. Like exactly. Yeah. You have to show that for any case of Hamiltonian path, uh, you have to show how to transform it into possibly a special case of traveling salesman. Yeah. So. Not necessarily. No, yeah. No, no. You, you don't need to prove that because you already, since this is in NP and this is NP complete, if you care, you know that there is a way to transform this into this. Although it might be a very roundabout way, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, remember that one way to do this is to write down the Witness. the tour checking program, the witness checking program, compile that program all the way down to a Boolean circuit, transform the Boolean circuit into an instance of 3SAT, and change 3SAT in, into an instance of Hamiltonian path. But to prove that this is NP complete, you're not, I mean, you're not obligated to talk about that. What matters, you need to show that this is at least as hard as this. And to do that, all you need to do is show how to ch change any instance of this problem into an instance of this problem. Therefore, if you had a fast algorithm for traveling salesman, yes. you would also have a fast algorithm for Hamiltonian path. So if I have a Hamiltonian path on a graph, an instance of Hamiltonian path is just a graph. Yep. Without weight. Yes. So show me how to transform this into an instance of traveling salesman. So. OK, so if, if here's our graph, let's make every edge weight one. What about the pairs which are pairs of vertices which are not connected by an edge in our graph? What we should we give them? Because an instance of traveling salesman is a whole matrix of distances. Just infinity? Yeah, just. OK, let's make them infinity. infinity. Or if not infinity, a zillion. Let's make them a zillion. Yeah. OK? Larger than the yes. number of the edges. Yeah, by the way, a zillion is one followed by umpteen zeros. Wow. So, okay. so let's say it's something very large. Um, all right. 
The other th so now we have our matrix of distances. The other thing that we need is the total length L. So what do we set L equal to? Number of edges. Uh, the number of edges in the graph, or the vertices. Yeah, I think you said this. I mean, right. The number of vertices, if we want a cycle, or I guess actually that minus one, okay. if we want a path. Um, and the point is that, well, okay, so now, if this were on the final, you would have to, you know, you could say, it's obvious that I'm done, and you might get away with that depending on my mood. Um, <laughs> but uh, really what you need to show now, and if, and this is obvious for some reductions, but not obvious for others, is that the answer to the original Hamiltonian path problem is yes, if and only if the answer to this traveling salesman problem is yes. Well, let's just do this. In one direction, if there is a Hamiltonian path, clearly that will be our tour, clearly the length, since it goes around along these edges with weight one, is n, if it's a cycle, or n minus one if it's a path. Conversely, if there is no Hamiltonian path, what that means is the only way to tour these vertices in a way that visits each vertex once is for at least one of your steps to go from one city to another that are not connected by an edge. And as soon as you do that, the total length of your tour is at least n plus a zillion. And therefore, it's above this threshold. Yes? You have to find all paths, right? And then see what weight they have in your traveling salesman problem? No. Because okay. what if, the, um, say there's a Hamiltonian path, but its weight is too large? It costs too much. Why would it? I, I think you're con I think you're sort of you there you're you're mixing the two problems. So the Hamiltonian path problem, the input is just a graph, an unweighted graph. So there's no notion of of weight here. When we translate this into a traveling salesman problem, we get to design the weights, right? So again, the machinery is somebody, anybody gives us an instance of Hamiltonian path. It's a general case problem. We don't get to choose it. But when we do this, this reduction, we get to design the traveling salesman problem instance any way we want. So we get to say that the weight of all the edges, all the pairs which are edges will be one, and all the pairs which are not edges will be large. OK? Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, does this set of weights obey the triangle inequality? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Oh. <laughs> no, no, not really. No. Not really. no. Not really. <laughs> it very much doesn't because, you know, here, yeah. right, a zillion is much bigger than one plus one. Well, so how could we make this obey the triangle inequality? So what, so what the, next, the next logical question is, is the special case of the traveling salesman problem where we are guaranteed that the distances obey the triangle inequality, is that special case still NP complete? A priori, it's possible that by restricting it in that way, we're making the problem a lot easier. It's possible that the triangle inequality constrained Hamilt uh, traveling salesman problem is actually in P. So what should we do here if we want this to obey the triangle inequality? Just subtract some number from one edge and then the amount to another edge. Like this. All right. Well, did we really need the non edges to have weight a zillion? Do we really need them to have a really big weight? Um. It's enough that they have a somewhat bigger weight, right? Yep. Yeah. Because let's say that. Let's, for simplicity, let's say it's a cyclic tour, so I can stop saying n or n minus 1. Let's say it's just a cyclic tour. 
So then if we go along all the weight one edges, the total length is n. Well, all I need to make sure is that the total weight is bigger than n if we don't. Just make it larger than one. Anything bigger than one along here will do. So for instance, suppose we make all these non-edges weight two. Now does it obey the triangle inequality? Yep. Yes. Because two is less than or equal to one plus one. And it's also less than or equal to one plus two in case even these two edges don't exist. Okay, so, I mean, I hope you see what we did here. First, we reduced Hamiltonian path to the general case of traveling salesmen. I, I don't mean the general, I mean a special case, but that violated the triangle inequality. That's enough to prove that the traveling salesman problem is NP-complete. But then there's this restricted version of the traveling salesman problem, which might be easier, namely where the distances are guaranteed to obey the triangle inequality. We redid our reduction in a slightly more careful way to show that even that restricted case is still NP-complete. Okay. Right? So this still doesn't prove that the Euclidean traveling salesman problem is NP-complete. <clears throat> Because to prove that the Euclidean one is NP-complete is not enough to give you these distances, right? I would actually need to show you how to lay cities out in the plane, in the two-dimensional plane. And that's, that takes much more work. Isn't the, the vertex to play cities? So I see. Even the one? Sorry? I mean... I, I mean, look, if, if I give you if I give you these distances, can you put? Are there actually five places where you can put these cities in the plane so that the real straight line distances measured with a ruler oh, are these right. ones and twos? Probably not, right? So if you wanted to show that the Euclidean version of the traveling salesman problem was NP complete, you would need to do a much more careful reduction, where the output of the reduction is not just a graph with weights, yeah, but an actual imagine. placement in the plane. And that can be done, but I, I actually, I've never bothered to learn how. Um, anyway, so the other thing I've asked Nate to show you is that for the, let's call this the triangle inequality traveling salesman problem, there is a very simple two approximation, which finds a tour which is at most twice as long as the shortest possible and which runs in polynomial time. There's a slightly better, there's a slightly fancier algorithm which gives a three halves approximation. And it turns out that in the Euclidean version, there is a one plus epsilon approximation. What does this mean? It means that although finding the absolute shortest path we think takes exponential time, the shortest tour, if you're willing to invest more and more time, you can get closer and closer to the optimum. Okay? And specifically, the time it takes you to run here is some polynomial in something like n over epsilon. So to get closer to the optimum, to push epsilon down, it takes you longer, but only polynomially longer. So this is interesting, right? Because what this says is that for all practical purposes, this problem is insolvable in polynomial time. You can get as close to the optimum as you want in polynomial time. So what this, I mean, when we discussed NP-completeness, we kind of took the view that, well, NP-complete problems can all be reduced to each other, so they're all equally hard. If one of them is NP, they all are. Okay. Well, but when you look more closely at NP-hard optimization problems, it turns out that they're not all equally hard. Some of them can be approximated within polynomial time, but some of them can't be. 
uh, unless p equals np. So there's actually, that gives you an interesting, uh, interesting distinctions that you can make between one np complete problem and another. It is believed that for vertex cover, you cannot do a ratio better than two in polynomial time. Okay? In other words, it's believed that if you can, if you can approximate vertex cover within 1.9 in polynomial time, then p equals np. So what that says is that for vertex cover, in polynomial time you can get within a factor of two, but to get any closer is just as hard as getting the best, the optimum, which is np complete. Whereas for the Euclidean version of the traveling salesman problem, you can get as close as you want in polynomial time. So it is much, it is more approximable. It's much easier to approximate. Okay. So anyway, that's what Nate, that's what Nate is going to tell you about. Okay. Good. And you'll get lots of practice proving things are NP complete on homework number three. All right. So um, any questions about this? Is that just for next class? Uh, Thursday and. Next week. The next two, yes. <coughs> and Nate will also tell you a little bit about his work with uh, Professor Shuang Luan about approximation algorithms for cancer therapy. Okay. So, uh, you know, you want to do damage to the tumor and not much damage to the rest of the body. You don't want this to take too much time. Um, what's the best thing to do? And uh, so, Professor Luan actually works with people in the medical school and at the UNM hospital uh, to design algorithms for radiation therapy of various kinds, and Nate has been working with him on that. So, uh, okay. All right. So, today I want to just finish up with the Turing machine. So, you know, I know that it, these after lunch slots are hard and when I start talking about, well, let's create the integers from scratch, you know, I understand. I mean, I might have trouble staying awake if I weren't up here, you know, stoked on adrenaline and all that, but, uh, but let's finish up with the Turing machine, which is something we should all know. Yes? Uh, I'm just uh, going back to that, that thing that you said that we don't have good approximation algorithms for all problems which are I mean, yes. We have, I mean, suppose we have a good approximation algorithm for a single NP-complete problem. <coughs> and then can't we use these, these polynomial time reductions to have good, good approximation algorithms for all NP-complete problems? Excellent question. So to repeat the question, um, uh, let's, you know, it seems strange since we know that we can transform uh, NP-complete problems into each other, it seems strange to say that we can get a good, get a good solution to one and not a good solution to the other. Um, you know, so how can it be that in polynomial time some can be approximated close to the optimum and others cannot? Well, um, the reason is that our transformations between NP-complete problems are actually transformations between decision problems, yes and no, yes and no problems. So if you have you know, usually what happens is you're trying to solve, say, a minimization problem, and each potential solution has some kind of score. Like in a vertex cover, the number of vertices, and we're trying to minimize that. Um, so when we can, what we usually do is we define a threshold, and we ask you, can you do any better than this? Or for a maximization problem, like max sat where you're trying to satisfy as many clauses as you can. You want to do, we'll know if you can do at this score or better. So when you look closely at these reductions, what you find is that sometimes the reduction correctly maps the yes or no question above or below this line to the yes or no question above or below this line for some other problem. But this reduction doesn't necessarily, 
it's not necessarily a continuous function of the score. Okay, so it could be that a very good solution to this one, which is just a little bit above the, the true minimum, maps onto a very bad solution of a different problem. I mean, the other thing is that, you know, a, a lot of the NP-complete problems we wrote down and proved reductions between aren't even minimization or maximization problems at all. Um, so, but basically that's the, that's the issue. So it's certainly true that if, if the way your reduction works, um, okay, so let's say you're, let's consider a kind of max version of three color ability, okay? So I have a graph and let's say that I, it's not three colorable. I cannot color the vertices with three colors so, such that every edge has two colors of different, two ends of different color. Okay, well, I could ask, how many edges can I make that way? Okay, um, or to put, to put it differently, how small can I make the number of unhappy edges where an edge is unhappy if it's two ends of the same color? Well, if I map that problem to max 3SAT, say, it's going to map pretty smoothly. So each edge will become a little, a couple of clauses or something. And if this edge is unhappy, then one or two of those clauses will be unhappy. In a case like that, a good solution, to the, a good approximation here will give me a good approximation there. But not all reductions look like that. Um, and for instance, some of them might go through a decision problem which isn't even a maximization or minimization problem. It's just a yes or no. So, yeah. So you're saying zero or some within the MP complete class? Zero sum kind of subclass regarding how easy that those will be approximated. Right. Like right. So, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that if your answer is, if your question is just, can I get the answer in polynomial time or not? In that sense, all NP complete problems are equally hard. Oh, yeah. But once you start asking questions about, okay, maybe I can't find the optimum. Can I get within some ratio of the optimum? That then it turns, yeah, then, then actually the N, NP complete problems break into several subclasses. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, maybe Nate will. Um, I mean, there are classes like APX. I forget what the X is for. But basically, those are the ones that can be approximated. And then there's this thing called a fully polynomial approximation scheme which is like what we have for Euclidean traveling salesmen, where you can get closer and closer. You can get epsilon uh, as small as you want, but again, the running time only grows polynomially in one over epsilon. So you can get 10 times closer with an investment of only, say, 10 or 100 times more work. And this is kind of the best we could possibly hope for. Um, okay. All right. So, any other questions? Okay. So, um, we talked about recursive functions. Um, and we compared them to programs. Uh, where, remember, composition, so the, the recursive functions, we're allowed to build new functions from old functions by taking their composition, or doing this primitive recursive thing, or doing this thing called mu, where we just look for the smallest solution, and it's undefined if there aren't any. And those mapped very nicely onto things that are still alive today in many of the programming languages that we know and love. Primitive recursion is just a for loop, and that mu recursion is just a while loop, and uh, the program might not ever halt, in which case the function is undefined. And we talked a little bit about lambda calculus. Okay. So um, between 1931 and 1936, there were these multiple notions of uh, you know, these multiple definitions of what it means for a function to be computable. And again, this 
came about because, uh, I think I told you this, so David Hilbert asked this question, can we mechanize mathematics? He said, is there a mechanical procedure which will prove all the true theorems? And I'm very happy that there isn't one, because again, then I'd be out of a job, but let's say that uh, that was his question. So then the question is, well, what counts as a, as a mechanical procedure? How do you give a clear definition of that? And in particular, what functions and what proof techniques are mechanical procedures? So lambda calculus is basically string rewriting. And well, these are recursive functions and these are like imperative programs. And all of these are things that we know we can do on computers nowadays. So now it's kind of <laughs> obvious that, oh, well, these are all things you can carry out mechanically. The question is whether these include everything <coughs> which should count as a mechanical procedure, okay? The question is, is there any algorithm which if you wrote it down and showed it to me, I would agree, oh yes, that is an algorithm that we could do if we wished, that we could carry out if we wished. Is there any algorithm which doesn't fit in these classes? So, do the recursive functions really cover all the functions which any reasonable person would agree can be computed? Is a programming language like C, an imperative programming language, is it really capable of doing all the things that a computer could possibly do? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe there's something that your computer could do that no C program does because maybe these are not enough tools to have in the control flow of the program. Maybe there's some other kind of loop that you really need. And in case you think that that's a totally stupid question, we talked a couple lectures ago about the fact that if I take away the while loop, then there are things that you cannot do. So maybe there's something else missing here. If for isn't enough, how do you know that for and while are enough? Um, and then lambda calculus, which now survives in the form of programming languages like Lisp and Scheme, can it do everything? Or are there some things that just can't be written in Lisp? So um, it turns out that uh, all of these things are equally powerful and uh, they're all equally powerful as the Turing machine. And this was in 1936. And basically, you know, up until Turing came along, people said, well, I, I think we've covered all the reasonable ways to make, to define functions in terms of other functions. Okay. I mean, that sounds more like a philosophical stance than a mathematical claim because of this word reasonable, right? And then Church said, well, my lambda calculus, that covers everything. Anything, any, any mechanical procedure can be done with string rewriting the way lambda calculus does. And Gödel said, why should I believe that? You know, you've invented this thing, it's kind of pretty, but why should I believe that this, is a, that this covers every possible algorithm, every possible mechanical procedure? So, then Turing came along, and it wasn't until Turing machine that everybody kind of agreed, ah, yes, that's the right definition. That covers everything which could reasonably be carried out by any sort of mechanical device or any sort of procedure. Um, and moreover, it turns out that all of these things are equal in power to the Turing machine. So in retrospect, yes, each of these is also a good definition of what we can do. In other words, it's it's computationally universal. It, it, does, it does everything that a computer can do. Computationally universal. And now this is still, uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll get back to the status of this. This isn't a theorem, okay? Again, this is a philosophical stance. Um, but it's, it, it feels very firm. So let me describe the Turing machine. So um, how many of you already know the definition of a Turing machine? 
Yeah, okay, all right. So the Turing machine was originally not a model of a computer. It was originally a model of a human being who is carefully carrying out some calculation. In fact, you should know that the word computer used to refer to human beings. So, for instance, there were roomfuls of people uh, at Los Alamos who would pass pieces of paper of partially done computations to each other. And they did things like extract cube roots to do things like figure out whether uranium 230 whatever was going to be above critical mass or not. So you didn't have computers to do these simulations, so you used people. So they were called computers. Um, for a while, electronic computers were called electronic computers to make it clear that we weren't talking about people. Um, so the Turing machine is, uh, is a model of a human being. Here's the human being right here. And the human being only has a finite set of internal states. The human being is a finite creature. This might violate your opinion about human beings, but um, you know, states like, okay, now I need to do step four because uh, I'm done with step three, or gee, I really want some coffee, and states like that. So this human being doesn't have very much storage space. But luckily, he or she has lots of paper and a pencil. <coughs> So for convenience, we're going to lay the paper out in a big roll. OK, so it's going to be a big, long tape. Um, and at each place on the tape where the human being is looking at right now, there's going to be a symbol written, which is in some finite alphabet, which is usually called capital sigma. Um, and at each step of the calculation, what the human being does is they read the symbol written on the part of the tape they are at right now. If they like, they can erase it and change it to a new one. And then they move one step left or right. OK? And so formally, what you have is a transition function which takes your current state and the current and the symbol written on the tape at your current location. Based only on that, we might change to a new state. I, I forgot to say that. We could certainly change our internal state. We can, if we wish, overwrite the symbol with a new one. And if we like, we can move left or right. All right. So our dynamics depends only on our internal state and the symbol at our current location. But we can change it and then move. And um, so how does a Turing machine calculate a function? Well, you write the input on the tape. But there's also lots of blank space on the tape, say we're covered with, if you want to be formal about it, a special symbol called blank. And then you start working. And at the end, of the calculation, you let's say that you've written the result on the tape that's supposed to be tidy. You've cleaned up and erased all your work. And then you enter a special state, which we'll call the halting state, which is a special member of your set of states. And you halt and you say, I'm done. OK? So. Why the specifics here? Why a one-dimensional tape, for instance? Um, well, so Turing, so, so Gödel called Turing's paper a work of applied philosophy. So he basically said, look, what does a human being do when they carry out a mechanical, uh, well-defined mathematical procedure? And then he sort of started with that picture of a human being sitting down with pencil and paper, and then tried to simplify it as far as possible. Okay, so you know one one claim is that well whether or not you believe whether or not you believe that your brain actually only has a finite number of states, it seems reasonable to think 
that the part of your brain which is carrying out this mechanical procedure of finding a cube root or something, you're following a recipe, what we would now call a program, and for the purposes of doing this calculation, you only have a finite number of states, what step of the program you're currently running. Um, and you could imagine that we can sort of see a lot of this tape at once, but clearly we, can only, we only sort of need to look at a finite amount of it at any one time. So let's say that there's just a finite symbol set and that we look at one cell on the tape at once. And it could be that we, you know, have a big, uh, have paper spread out across the whole floor, but it seems clear that a one-dimensional tape is enough. If you need more workspace, just run to the right until you find the first blank space. If you need to read something that you wrote down before, just run back here until you find it. You can write special symbols next to it to say, this is what I need to look at to do step seven, and so on. Okay? So basically what Turing tries to do in his paper is he tries to argue that this model is general enough to encompass any algorithm that a human being could actually carry out with pencil and paper. All right. Well, of course, this, is, this then quickly became a, a model of an electronic computer when von Neumann got a hold of it. Um, and this is what we now call the CPU, and this is what we now call the memory. This is a lot like a magnetic tape, something which, you know, people used to put, anyway, it's an ancient memory technology. And um, the only thing is von Neumann said, well, having to literally spool the tape to the place we want seems a little bit clunky, so let's add a random access memory to it. So let's so that I can plug in a memory address and the memory goes and looks up a block of memory for me so I don't have to literally spool over there um, in time proportional to the length of the tape. But besides that, the modern computer is pretty much a Turing machine. So von Neumann added the RAM, the random access memory. Um, then the other thing Turing did was he wrote down, uh, he proved that Turing machines can do everything recursive functions can do. And vice versa, that what a Turing machine does is a recursive function. So how do you prove that? Well, if you actually look at his paper, it looks pretty awful because, I mean, he does it carefully kind of at this hardware level of reasoning. But the intuition is pretty clear. So remember what recursive functions do if f and g are already defined, you can do their composition. Well, is it clear that if a Turing machine can calculate f and it can calculate g, then there's another Turing machine that calculates their composition? How would that work? Well, these are two different Turing machines, right? So, so the, idea, the idea is that everything that we now call a program is written into this transition function here, which tells us what to do if you are currently in this state and currently in this symbol. But Can you just like take the inner product of both machines where your alphabet is you know, um, now two-dimensional for every possible combination of the two Turing machines tapes? Uh, so I think you mean like the Cartesian product. Yeah. Right, so we could make a bigger Turing machine which has all the states of this machine and all the states of that one. Um, and uh, so now depending on which state it's in, it either calculates F or it calculates G. And then what do we do when we're done calculating G? Instead of halting, we just switch into the other set of states and calculate F on the result. So we take the original input, calculate G, then treat that as the input of calculating F, and we're done. Then halt. Right, so, and, and then halt, yeah. And similarly, you know, these, these recursive functions, like H of 0 comma Y equals F of Y, and H of X plus 1 comma Y equals G of blah, 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 
Um, well, remember, we could treat this as a for loop. So you start by calculating this thing, that's the base case, and then you apply this function uh, x times to get the value of x that you want. And OK, so you can do that with a Turing machine, too. A Turing machine can do a for loop. It just does something a bunch of times. Each time it does it, it runs back over to a little place on the tape where it keeps the counter of how many times it's done it so far. And then it runs back over here and does it again until this counter equals this other value. And, you know, how do you increment a counter in a Turing machine? Change. Well, you know, if this is a 1, you change it to a 0 and move left because you have to carry the 1. And then if this is a 0, you change it to a 1 and, and so on. And clearly, by shuttling back and forth between this number and this number, we could check that we could compare each of these bits to each of these bits and check to see whether this counter is less than the number of loops you're supposed to do, and so on. Okay, so it would be cruel at this point to ask someone to actually write down a Turing machine that does these things. Um, but you could if there was an evil dictator forcing you to do so. Okay? So, uh, so Turing machines can do everything that modern programming languages can, and indeed that's flipping the chronological order, right? Modern programming languages were written, if you like, as a high-level way of describing really big Turing machines, in a funny sense. All right? So with this picture of a human being sitting down with pencil and paper, um, everybody agreed that, yes, this seems to cover everything that we could possibly call an algorithm <coughs> that we could carry out. Um, and then it was very nice that it turned out that this is equivalent to all these models. So, I mean, what this says is that... Um, you know, you might worry that computability is a little bit like pornography, right? There's a famous quote from the Supreme Court saying, I can't quite define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> so you could worry that there's no way to capture the set of all algorithms, right? And you could worry that, well, lots of different algorithms, each one has, a, has somewhat different ideas than the other. If you go back to, say... 1920, it's not obvious that there's a way to capture every possible algorithm and wrap a big circle around them all and say, this is the set of all things that are computable. And you might also worry that different notions of computation each differ slightly in how powerful they are, right? So maybe your type of machine or your type of programming language can do a slightly different set of things than what mine can do. And this would be annoying because it would say that what is computable is kind of a subjective matter, that maybe you can compute things that I can't and vice versa. But happily, that's not the case. Happily, it turns out that every definition that anybody's ever written down for a model of computation are, are all equivalent to each other. And this makes me feel like sort of if, if you're walking around in the platonic world of forms, right, where, all, where abstract mathematical objects live, the boundary between what's computable and what isn't is really there. It's something you could really stub your toe on. It's not just a matter of taste. It's not just a matter of the particular powers of your particular computer. Um, it's really an objective thing. All right, and then, and then the other thing Turing did in that paper besides prove that Turing machines and recursive functions are equally powerful is he stated the halting problem and he proved using the kind of diagonal argument that we already went through that there's no Turing machine which can look at another Turing machine and tell whether it can halt. And what do I mean by look at it? Well, if I have a Turing machine it only has a finite number of states and a finite number of symbols. So this whole table of what it does when it's in each state and when it sees each symbol is some finite table. 
And I could take that table and write it on the tape of another Turing machine and then ask this other Turing machine to answer questions about this one, like, will it ever halt? So um, Turing did show that Turing machines are universal, or we might call them programmable, in the sense that there is a, a specific Turing machine whose job it is to simulate other Turing machines. And again, this is, well, we were like, yeah, well, big deal. That's just software. Just run the program. But back then, it was a big deal. And um, so it's Turing machines can interpret other Turing machines. They can simulate them step by step. They just sort of run over here and check this part of the tape to see what to do next. And then they run over there and do it, and then run back again to see what to do next. And they keep looking up in this Turing machine's transition table what to do. Um, but he proved that they can't tell whether another Turing machine will eventually halt. So the halting problem is undecidable. Um, and, you know, Turing was a very brilliant guy. It's a lot harder to write down that diagonal argument, again, sort of at the hardware level, than it is nowadays. We just say, well, if you have a program that does this, then just run it on itself and have it halt if it doesn't and not halt if it does, and bang, it's a contradiction. Writing all that down explicitly in terms of a Turing machine takes a lot more work. So it's nice that we have these high-level programming concepts now because they make it a lot easier to prove things like undecidability. Yes? Did they actually make Turing machines that simulated lambda calculus to prove that they're universal? Uh, no. Happily, the logician <coughs> clean had a few years earlier shown that these two were equally powerful. And then Turing connected these two. Yeah. Um, there's another one which is often mentioned called Post's tag system. So this is another kind of string rewriting system. Post was sort of outside the orbit of these uh, German and English philosophers, he was working at the City University in New York, and he wasn't very well funded, so his work didn't get recognized for a while. Um, but it should also sort of be included as an early model of computation, which turned out to be equally powerful. All right, so now, now that we have this Turing machine, let me try to drive home this point that it's universal. Because you could ask, well, gosh, if I can have one head moving around on this Turing machine, why not two? Is this any more powerful than the original Turing machine? Can this do things that the original vanilla Turing machine with one head cannot? Um, always Prove it. Always move, you can always move, move to that. Yeah. Exactly. We simulate this with one head by placing a special marker symbol here. And then our one head just sort of goes back and forth looking for these marker symbols. Maybe this is head one and this is head two. And we mark where the head is. And then our single head machine simulates the two head machine by running over there and finding the marker and then doing whatever that head would do. Okay? So more heads don't, do not make us any more powerful. What about more tapes? What if I give you two tapes instead of one? Does that make you more powerful? Are you have another one head per tape? Reader on the second tape? Let's say, let's say that what I have now is here's my finite state machine, and it can simultaneously read one place on this tape and one place on that tape. Okay. okay. Is this any more powerful than the vanilla Turing machine? I'm just going to put that tape in the end. Just tape and then switch. To that. We could put it at the end, I guess, but um, that might get awkward if we want to. I mean, the tape is really, there's the part that we've written on so far, which is finite because we've been working for a finite amount of time. But then there's sort of lots and lots of blank stuff beyond that. And if we had this at the end, well, I guess we could go back and copy everything over <laughs> so that then we'd have more room on this one. But there's another way to write two tapes as one. What's another way to absorb two tapes into one? Oh, yeah, just combine. Yeah, I mean, remember, we can, we can make our, our, just as we did with finite state machines, right? 
we can make the set of states or the set of symbols bigger as long as it's still finite. So we'll just write the two things side by side, and each symbol will be a pair, this symbol and that symbol. Or you could make them alternate. That's another way to do it. OK, so two tapes, that's not any more powerful. So more heads, more tapes. Might as well just be one head and one tape. Um, well, gosh, what about, a, what about giving you a two-dimensional grid so that now a 2D Turing machine is one which, instead of moving just left or right, it can move north, south, east, or west. Okay? And read and write the symbol and change its internal state. Can this be simulated by a vanilla Turing machine? Okay. Kind of like it's the same. It's just, just a bigger sets. Well, the problem is we can't we can't absorb this whole column here into a single into a single cell. Okay. Why not? It's infinite long. Well, it, it'll get as we write more things in this column, then the, the the tuple of symbols here will get bigger and bigger. So we're not allowed to make our alphabet bigger on the fly, right? We're not allowed to make it bigger at runtime when we're running this thing. How else could I fit this into a one-dimensional tape? You still have a start square? Yeah. And like in the corner, and then it's infinite in both directions? Or maybe the start square is in the center, and it's infinite all around. Isn't it like linear really array one. indexing in C, where you can have any dimensional array you want, but it's really just one long string? Well, yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, after, I mean, we don't have to design computers this way, but the way we've chosen to design computers, uh, we have random access, but we still basically think of our memory as a long string, right? When, when your random access memory looks something up, it doesn't give a pair of addresses, like an X and a Y. It just gives a single address. Now, usually we do that by, we know in advance the size of this 2D array, and so we can do this row, and then that row, and then that row. But what if it's growing? Well, there are a zillion ways to do it. One of my I mean, you could do it as a spiral, right? Oh. That would be a little tricky, but you could do it, right? Because you could calculate where on this spiral you end up if you're here and you move north. It's a little calculation, a little bit of arithmetic. <laughs> And you can do that little bit of arithmetic over here on some part of the tape. Okay? Or you could do this, this standard linear indexing, and every time that you move outside the rectangle you're in so far, you say, okay, I'm going to re-index with a bigger rectangle and copy everything over onto a new part of the tape. Okay? So the moral here is that Anything that you can, nearly any way to soup up a Turing machine, any way to supercharge a Turing machine that you can think of, you're not actually making it any more powerful than the original one tape, one head Turing machine. Um, and uh, so sort of after you, after you play with that a little while, you start to think, okay, this thing really is universal. It can do any reasonable procedure. Um, and this belief is called the Church-Turing thesis. Again, it's called a thesis because it's a philosophical position. It's not a mathematical conjecture. But the Church-Turing thesis is the claim that Turing machines can do anything which any, any procedure which could reasonably be called an algorithm or a program or a mechanical procedure. Um, now, there are some crazy things that you could imagine. So here's one. The Turing machine does its first step in one second, its next step in half a second, its next step in a quarter of a second, and its next step in an eighth of a second. And by the time it's been running for two seconds, it's done an infinite number of steps. Okay. 
and then based on what it has learned from an infinite amount of computation, then it does something else. Well, all right. So if you trawl the web, you'll find in some of the dustier corners of academia um, stuff about Zeno computation or even hyper computation. And these things are fun to think about, but they don't seem very physical. I mean, how would you build this thing? Um, presumably, I mean, roughly speaking, you can make computers run faster by pumping more power through them, but, well, eventually it will melt or blow up or something. So um, there is a version of the church Turing thesis, which is the physical church Turing thesis. And the physical church Turing thesis says that any computing device which you can actually build in the universe in which we live can be simulated by a Turing machine. So unlike the church Turing th thesis, the physical church Turing thesis is actually a, it is a falsifiable statement about the world. Okay? So, right, falsifiable means Something isn't science unless it's falsifiable, right? Falsifiable means that there is an experiment you could do, which if it comes out a certain way, you would know you're wrong. Okay? If your statement is not falsifiable, oh, it might be true, but it's not science. So this is a falsifiable claim. I could do an experiment. I could build some exotic device with, you know, throw some black holes and some Planck scale space-time fluctuations and a bunch of other things, and lo and behold, it could do something uncomputable. And that would disprove this conjecture. So this is a belief about the physical world. And um, Feynman was very interested in this. So you may have heard of the Feynman lectures on physics, which are widely believed to be some of the nicest explanations of physics ever given by anybody. Lesser known are Feynman lectures on computation. Um, and he asks this question. He says, in a finite volume of space and time, if I take the, um, a box one meter on a side and I let the universe do what it does for one second, is the amount of information processing that happens in that volume of space time finite or not? Well, we don't actually know. You know, um, and of course this gets into quantum computing, but quantum computing, it appears it can do certain things faster than classical computers, but in terms of what it can do eventually, it is equivalent to a Turing machine. So what's, com you know, Turing machines, classical computers can simulate quantum computers. They just might take exponential time but eventually they'll get the answer right. So quantum mechanics doesn't change what's computable, even though it might change what is computable in polynomial time. Um, but in the same way, you know, we don't really know. It's, it's related to questions like, if you look at the smallest scales of space and time, are things actually discrete? Are there actually only a finite number of positions in this meter box? Are there actually only a finite number of moments over the course of a second? If so, then, you know, it seems like it's a finite amount of computation. But if things are really continuous all the way down, then maybe simulating the system exactly would take an infinite amount of computation. But then again, maybe a lot of that information is kind of down in the noise and you couldn't actually use it to do a computation. So maybe in some effective sense, the amount of computation is only finite. Anyway, all right. So that's a good philosophical note to end on. I hope you enjoy Nate's lectures. Um, I want you to read uh, chapter, is it six? The one called, the one about memory. So between now and when I return, start reading this chapter. Read as much of it as you can. And that's what we'll work on when I get back. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, we're going to talk about it on Thursday. Yeah.